I would wake up in a panic in the middle of the night and I couldn't tell if it was still the dream or if it was still reality. Um, I would wake up and I would see dark figures in my room. I would see different things that were just awful and terrifying as a child and even as an adult, to be honest, to see. And so I did what any child would do when they're afraid. I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would run straight to my mom's room and I would just refuse to go back to my room to sleep. And, and my mom being the, the loving, gracious mom that she was, she would let me sleep in her room. But after a while, I realized that even sleeping in her room, literally night right next to her, I would still be woken up with this horrific, just terrible, terrible nightmares. And so one night, my mother being the strong woman of prayer and of faith that she is, she came into my room one night and she looked at me and she said, Athena, you don't have to live in fear anymore. And I was too young to fully understand what she meant, but I was old enough to understand that she was coming to me with a solution for this thing. And so then she began by kneeling next to my bed, prompted me to do the same, and she proceeded on with teaching me what would be the very first prayer I would ever learn in my life. And I learned this prayer I recited it with her, and then a couple of nights after, I began saying it on my own. And so uh, every night, this became part of my night routine, that before I would go to sleep, I would say this specific prayer and then go to sleep. And I noticed the nightmares stopped. They, they did stop. But one night in particular, something that I will never forget in my life happened. Um, I was sleeping. It was in the middle of the night. And all of a sudden, I just I woke up as though you know, like I had finished, like I had finished my sleep. Like I had just, it was like the morning. I was just fully awake and I woke up, but it was still nighttime. And I remember just kind of waking up, opening up my eyes and looking at the edge of my bed. And at the edge of my bed, there was what looked like this knight. He was dressed in this full armor. I couldn't see his face. It was metal from top to bottom. And he stood at the edge of my bed holding the spear. And I just remember looking at him, and any other time when I knew it was something terrifying, I would freak out, I would cry, I would scream. But this night, this one particular night, when I opened my eyes and I saw him standing at the edge of my bed, I immediately felt just a sense of peace and security. And I didn't know as a child that night what that was. And years would go on before I would even tell my mom what I saw that night. But in hindsight, later on, I learned that that night, it was a moment in which Really, God had delivered me from my fears, and he was showing me that in that place, in that space where I would be getting sleep and I would be getting rest, that there was something there that God had placed to protect me and to give me a nightful rest. And I realized that years later, until this day, I have a very clear, vivid memory of where he stood, what he looked like, how tall he was. I very clear, vivid memory. And every time I think of that, I remember, wow, God is so good that even at the tender age of five, he still listened to my prayers and he delivered me from my fears. You see, that night, my mother taught me a very, very important lesson. She taught me that although fear is a very real part of life, there is one who is God that is able to deliver us from all of our fears. And that in time of fear, we ought to turn and run towards him. So God's most spoken command to us in scripture is fear not. He tells us to fear not 365 times in his word, literally one time for every day of the year. And I believe that he has said this as many times as he has because God does not intend for you and I to live our life, our short life, being preoccupied with worry and fear and anxiety, especially not when there has been a price that's already been paid for us to live a life of peace, of freedom, and of victory. His repeated command to fear not is clear evidence that he doesn't want our minds to be clouded by and our lives to be crippled or guided by fear. In Psalm 23, 4, David says, even though I walk through the darkest of valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort and protect me. I will not be afraid is a very strong statement that David makes in that verse. You see, fear is a choice. It's one of the two options that different seasons of life will oftentimes present to us. It's a choice that we make based upon what we decide we're going to believe. And anytime we choose fear over faith, we communicate that we believe the circumstances and events of our lives hold greater power 
than the one who actually holds our lives in his hands. David says, even though I walk through the darkest of valley, some of us in this room this morning are walking through some dark valleys and facing fear of many sorts. Fear of sickness, fear of death, fear of losing a job, fear of losing a marriage, fear of being lonely, fear of being replaced, fear of being forgotten, fear of being rejected, fear of not being accepted, fear of never getting married, fear of never having kids. Fear is constantly trying to grab a hold of our lives because it's the enemy's greatest tool to stop us from where God has called us to go and from becoming who God has called us to be. In the same way that faith empowers us and propels us into the purpose and will of God, fear cripples us from stepping into it and experiencing the fullness that it has. But David says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, in other words, even if I am fearful of this situation, even if I am fearful of this medical report, even if I am fearful of this uncertainty, my life and my decisions and my choices will not be dictated by fear, especially not God, when I know that you are beside me, protecting me and comforting me. You see, because of the truth that David knew, because he was so familiar with the character and nature of God, he chose not to cave in to fear. And because he chose not to cave into fear, he was able to step into the fullness of God's promises for his life. So if you're ever going to step into all that God has for you, if you're ever going to step into all that God has for you and calls you to be, then you have got to learn how to overcome fear. Amen. Because hear me out. Anytime fear enters the domain of your life, you can rest assured that it did not come from God. Anytime fear enters the domain of your conversations, anytime fear enters the domain of your thoughts, anytime fear enters the domain of your choices or the decisions that you make, it did not come from God. How do we know this? We know this because in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, we read that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. So if you're taking notes this morning, the title of our message is going to be Overcoming Fear. Overcoming Fear. And what I want to do today is talk to you about three observations made from a man named Jehoshaphat, whose life and story is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. We're going to turn and begin to just look at his life and, and draw out three very important uh, observations that we can begin to apply in our own lives as we are faced with fear. Now, as you're turning to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, we're going to be reading from verse 1 to 4. And as you turn to that, I want to just take a couple of seconds here and just share some, some really important facts about who this man was. King Jehoshaphat was the fourth king of Judah. The Bible tells us that, spiritually speaking, King Jehoshaphat began his reign in a very positive way. We know this because in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, just a few chapters ahead, the Bible tells us that the Lord was with King Jehoshaphat because he followed the ways of King David before him and did not consult or practice idol worship. So we know that he was the fourth king of Judah, and we also know that this was a king who was very intentional with walking right before the Lord. He was very intentional with making sure that the people in the land knew the laws of God. He was very intentional with making sure that people worshipped only the one true living God. He did not consult to idol worship like the other surrounding kingdoms did. And so this was a king who obviously was trying to do things right in the right way. Are you with me so far? Yes? Okay, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and read 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 1 to 4. After this, the armies of the Moabites, Ammonites, and some of the Munites declared war on Jehoshaphat. Messengers came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army from Edom is marching against you from beyond the Dead Sea. They are already at Hazazon Tamar. Jehoshaphat was terrified by this news and begged the Lord for guidance. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Let me just make a really quick 
interesting point here that stood out before we even begin talking about some of those observations. You will notice that in verse two and three, it says that messengers came running to the king to let him know that there were armies coming for him. And verse three immediately begins by telling us Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news. Be very mindful of who you give an ear to to your life. Be very mindful of who you give an ear to in your life. King Jehoshaphat became fearful after what he heard because what he heard didn't fuel his faith, it fueled his fears. What type of company are you surrounding yourself with? What type of conversations are you engaging in and what type of things are you allowing yourself to hear and to feed? Because if what you're hearing is not feeding your faith, it's starving your faith. And if it's starving your faith, then it's feeding your fears. So be very mindful of who you give an ear to and what you allow to come into your life. I say this all the time when I have the opportunity that every decision we make matters. What we choose to entertain ourselves with matters. The conversations that we choose to engage in matter. The things that we choose to see or surround ourselves in matter. Every decision that we make in our life matters because it's doing one of two things. It's either feeding the faith that we have in God and reaffirming who he is in our life lives and confirming that he is good and that he is faithful and that he will never abandon us and that he will never forsake us or it's feeding fear in our lives which is causing us now to forget the goodness of God to forget the faithfulness of God to take a step back and to now forget that he's actually a faithful God who will keep his promises over our lives so be very mindful of what you give an ear to If what you are listening in your life today is not in alignment with the word of God, then it's not from God. Did you catch that? If what you are hearing today in your life is not in alignment with the word of God, with the faithfulness and character and nature of God and the promises of God, then it's not from God. And if it's not from God, then you can definitely be rest assured that it's not feeding your faith. Be mindful of what you give an ear to. Amen? Amen. All right. So the first observation I want to share with you from this section that we just read right here from verse 1 to 4, you are never going to believe what it is. It's going to blow your mind. Are you ready? Are you ready? Seek the Lord. Some of you laughed. It's too simple, but it's, but it's real. When faced with fear, seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat was terrified by the news and begged the Lord for guidance. Another translation will say, and he resolved to inquire of the Lord. He also ordered everyone in Judah to begin fasting. So people from all the towns of Judah came to Jerusalem to seek the Lord's help. Let me paint a picture for you here real quick. We just read that King Jehoshaphat, spiritually speaking, was a king that was uh, doing everything he could to walk right before the Lord. Militarily speaking as well, King Jehoshaphat was very powerful. He had all the resources that he needed. He had the armies that he needed, so much so that the Bible actually tells us that surrounding kingdoms feared Judah and made no war against him. So much so that even the Philistines would bring presents to him and silver for tribute. So this tells us that King Jehoshaphat was not the king to be messed with, that if War was ever declared that he had everything he needed to go and fight and defend his people and defend his country. He had everything he needed. He had the people he needed, the resources that he needed, the money that he needed, the armies that he needed, the strategies that he needed, so much so that not only the people in his own surround, in his own kingdom knew, but people outside of his kingdom also knew. So that speaks something to us, that this was not just someone who, who, had what an average king would have. This was a king who obviously was not to be messed with and not to be fearful uh, and not to be, and not to be, not to be messed with and to be feared of. And all of a sudden, the same very king who nobody wants to mess with, all of a sudden now gets a message that armies are coming to fight against him. He could have relied on all that he had, on the resources, the power, the armies, the strategies. He could have re- relied on all that he had He could have been confident and said, hey, listen, I've been walking right with God. I've been honoring him. I've only been worshiping him. I've made sure that my people also only worship him. So I know God's got my back. Let's go out to this battle and let's fight. He could have said that. And most of us would have agreed with him. Yeah, you're a king. You're in power. 
You're under attack. You're under threat. Go out and fight. God's going to be with you. Go ahead and do it. He could have done, he could have, he could have done that. But though he had the counsel and comfort of many around him, he did one thing that many of us oftentimes don't do when we are faced with fear. The Bible says he resolved to inquire of the Lord. He turned to God. In that moment, Jehoshaphat didn't try to take control of the situation, as many of us probably would. He didn't try to take control of the situation. All right, let's gather up the armies. Let's gather up everybody. Let's come up with a strategy. Let's go out and fight. He didn't try to take control of the situation. In fact, when he was faced with the greatest fear, the fear of possibly losing his kingdom, he did one thing, and that was he gave control to God. He didn't take control of the situation. He gave control of the situation to God. He didn't allow the alarming news to paralyze him and to send him into this passive behavior. He didn't get offended at God. God, how dare you do this? I've been walking right with you. I've been making sure that all people are in line with you, that we are worshiping with you. How dare you let this happen? He didn't get offended at God. He didn't get offended at people. Oh, y'all are good to me one minute and trying to wage war the next. I got you. I'll see you on the battlefield. He didn't get offended at people. He didn't get offended at God. He didn't complain, God, why are you letting this happen to me? He resolved to inquire of the Lord. He sought out after God in this moment. When so many other responses would have been easily justified, he did the one thing that's not common for many of us today, which is to simply seek the Lord. Not to take control of the situation, not to be passive about it, not to try to forget it and pretend that it's not there and pretend that it doesn't exist, not to try to, uh, you know, not, not, not to try to get offended at God for letting certain things happen to us, but he decided to do the one thing, inquire of the Lord. Who are you pursuing and whose counsel are you seeking in time of fear? I'm going to ask you this again. Who are you pursuing and whose counsel are you seeking in time of fear? Is it your friends? Is it your bank account? Is it your spouse? Is it your Instagram account? Hashtag this is speaking to me right now. Yeah, those things may be speaking to you right now, but God has actually a plan to deliver you from it, which is worth more. Seeking or pursuing these things in time of fear may bring temporary comfort in fear, but seeking God in fear will bring victory over fear. And that's what we need to understand. That when we begin to make him our priority, when we begin to seek him in time of fear as our first response to fear, then he doesn't only comfort us, but he delivers us. We spend so much time seeking after the wrong things or complaining or questioning God why and we miss the opportunity to see the victory that God wants us to walk through. In Psalm 34, 4, David says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. I sought the Lord and he answered me, he comforted me, he reassured me, and he also delivered me from my fears. You see, in God, we find comfort and deliverance. The problem is that so many of us are relying on different things and people to bring the comfort and the deliverance, and God is saying, man, you're never going to find it in those things until you begin to pursue me. And oftentimes, we make the mistake of running after, whether it be relationships, whether it be people, whether it be positions, whether it be financial security that we have, we begin to pursue after those things to find comfort in them. We begin to pursue those things to be delivered from fear. And we begin to look at all these different things to provide for us what only God can do for us. And because we're running in the wrong direction, pursuing for comfort and deliverance, and not towards God, we get frustrated when we're not comforted and delivered from my fears, from our fears. And now we begin to blame God. Well, where is he at when I needed him? Well, where is he at when I'm going through the situation? Well, where is he at? I've just received this medical report and I don't know where my life is going to be in the next six months. Where is he at? Are we running and seeking after God as our first response or our last response? Because a lot of us will go to everything else before we go to God and then go to God when we realize we can't find satisfaction in everything else. But what if we switched that order? What if God was our first response, our first course of action, and then everything else? What would life look like in the midst of fear if God was the one that we sought out after first and not last? 
David didn't say, I sought after my advisors in time of fear. I sought after my family in time of fear. I sought after the comfort of the promise that God had for me in time of fear. No, I sought the Lord. And he answered and he delivered me from all of my fears. Not some of my fears, not the fears that are the biggest in my life, not the fears that are the smallest in my life, from all my fears. Fear will reveal what we have placed our faith in. Fear will reveal what we have placed our faith in. Have we placed it in people or have we placed it in God? Have we placed it in our security of finances and of life and of the dreams that we've secured and of where we're going or have we placed it in God? Have we placed it in our spouse or have we placed it in God? Fear does a great job at exposing what we have placed our fear in. The second observation that we make from King Jehoshaphat's life is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15 to 17, which is just a few verses below. Now, let me tell you a little bit of what's happening from verse 4 to verse 17. So King Jehoshaphat declares for a fast, and he tells everyone, hey, not only am I going to pray for this, you're all going to pray for this, because all of our lives are at stake. So he declares this fast, and everybody begins to pray for days, seeking after the Lord's counsel. And so finally, um, as they've been praying, the word of the Lord finally comes upon a man named Jahil, who was a Levite, and now the Lord begins to prophesy in response to the prayers that have been going up in this season. And this is what the Lord begins to say. Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Say, do not be afraid. One more time, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Come on now. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow. No, give it up. Give it up to God. Give it up. Verse 16, tomorrow march out against them. You will find them coming up through the ascent of Ziz at the end of the valley that opens into the wilderness of Jeruel. But you will not even need to fight. Take your positions, then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. Some of us got a serious problem with standing still and letting God be God. He is with you, O people of Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid or discouraged. The second observation that we make from King Jehoshaphat's life is this. Let God be God. Say it with me. Let God be God. Let God be God. You will notice that God begins to answer to their prayers and he doesn't give them a military strategy. He doesn't give them a step-by-step -step plan as to how he's going to fight for them or what he's going to do, but he simply gives them his word that this battle is not theirs, but it's his. The battle is not yours, but God's. The battle is not yours, but God's. Some of us this morning need to be reminded that we are facing battles attempting to fight that are not ours to fight but God's and fear has a way of creeping in and convincing us to believe that we are pushed up against the wall that there is no other option that nothing is going to come for us that this is it our worst fears are going to come to life that what we feared about that sickness that's going to happen that that fear of death that we had that's going to happen that that fear of losing that marriage that's going to happen we get so pushed back and then we attempt to fight battles that are never meant to be fought by us but by God the battle is not yours, but God's. Stop trying to control the situation. Stop trying to control the situation. Stop panicking and running around as though you are a godless people. You have a God who is constantly fighting for you, who's ahead of you, who's defending you, who's out there literally waging war against the things that are coming to wage war against you. We can't just have faith in God when things are going good in our lives and forget that he's still faithful in the bad. Some of us have perfect faith when things are going good in our lives. We're out here praising and worshiping and lifting up our hands and putting up statuses on social media and loving the Lord and in love with him and, and literally bugging everybody down about the goodness of God. But the minute something goes left, all of a sudden from that same mouth comes discouragement instead of faith. Why? Where is the confidence that we have in who God is when things are going bad? Where is the confidence that now all of a sudden we had when we didn't get that job? 
when sickness strikes, when we lose a job, when that marriage is on the rocks, when finances are not coming through, when that application got denied, when that person that we thought we'd spend the rest of our lives with decides to leave us, where is our faith in God in those moments? Stop trying to take control of the situation. Let God be God. Some battles in our lives will rise up because God wants us to give him the opportunity to show us that he is for us. Did you hear that? That some battles in your life will rise up, not because God is expecting you to fight them, but because he wants you to step aside so that you can see him fight for you. And if he doesn't let some of those battles rise up, then when will he have the opportunity to show you who he is and what he can do? Let God be God. Let God be God. Say it with me one more time. Let God be God. Let God be God. And I hope this is not just a word that you're repeating after me because I'm telling you to say it and it's awkward if you don't. No. I really want you to begin feeding your faith with the reality that God is constant and unchanging. He's not like man where he changes his mind on us and leaves us when he feels like it and is with us right into the end when he feels like it. No, he's constant. He's faithful. He's unchanging. And he has made a commitment to you that he will never forsake you. And if we only begin to focus on the faithfulness and the promise that God has made in our lives, what would the battles that we face look like? The last observation that we make from King Jehoshaphat's life is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20 to 24. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, 20 to 24, the next few verses. This is what it says. Early next morning, the army of Judah went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. On the way, Jehoshaphat stopped and said, listen to me, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem. Believe, say believe, believe in the Lord your God and you will be able to stand firm. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. Let's pause right here. Let's just pause right here. The third observation that we pick up on how we can overcome fear from this story is learning to believe in his word. Learning to believe in his word. Here's the thing, right? So fear comes. They resolve to inquire of the Lord. The Lord comes and he says, the battle is not yours, it's mine. Stand still and let me win this victory for you. And so the word has arrived. The promise is there. But here's the reality. Faith was needed in the promise for it to turn into victory. See, they had to have faith in what God said he was going to do in order for them to walk through that process of victory. Are you hearing me? A lot of us here in this room, and we say this all the time in our messages, that we do not have a faith problem, we have a promise problem. That we have this problem of not being able to attach our faith to the promise of God and to what he says because we're not familiar with what he says. And so because we're not fully familiar of the promise that he's made to us, of the commitment that he's made to us, we have nothing now to attach our faith to. So it becomes a lot easier for us to attach our faith to the natural things that we see rather than to his promises because number one, we don't see them in the natural world and number two, we don't even know them. And so because we don't know what his word says, we have nothing to attach our promise to. You see, victory doesn't just happen because God has spoken something. For the record, God has been speaking over your lives since before you were even formed in your mother's womb. God has been speaking something into you since the beginning of time. He has been making promises to you since the beginning of time. He has been speaking to you through his word since the beginning of time. But the issue is this, right? Our faith can't be attached to those things because we're not aware of those things. What's the relationship that we have with the word of God in our lives? Oh man, that sounds like so basic, so Christian. Oh, do you read your Bible? Yeah, you, we, well, we need to hear the basics sometimes. It's because sometimes we're struggling in these very basic but needed principles that we don't see God in the more serious seasons of life. 
What's the relationship that we have with the word of God in our lives? Are we familiar what he says about us? Are we familiar what he says about himself? Are we growing in our understanding of who he is and now learning to attach our faith to what we actually know and what we have found security in, which is the promise of his word? Are we able to do that? Because if we're not, I'll tell you this right now, God can come down from his throne and tell you, don't worry, you're gonna get through this. There's gonna be victory. Don't worry, you're gonna, do th- you're gonna get through this. And we're still stuck in that place of feeling like we're about to be defeated because we're not familiar with his word. We're not familiar with his promises for our lives. You see, it wasn't just necessary for Jehoshaphat and his people to hear that God was gonna deliver them, but it was necessary for them to believe that he told them he was gonna deliver them. Faith now needed to be attached in the promise that he made to fight the battle for them. Do we have faith in what God has said for our lives? So many of us in this room today are facing some dark valleys and and marching into a battlefield thinking this is the end. This is it. This is going to ruin me. I'm done. I'm finished after this. But God wants to remind us this morning that no, it's not over. I'm fighting for you. And although that's comforting, I need you to know and believe that I'm going to do it. I don't just want you to know that I'm going to do it. I want you to believe that I'm going to do it. And here's what happens when they do that. Verse 21, after consulting the people, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. Can you imagine that for a second? Like, you're all about to die, right? At least that's what they think. And God tells them, don't worry, I'm going to fight for you. And they're literally marching on. Can you just picture this for a minute? A battlefield, a battlefield where there's nothing but swords, spears, horses, and chariots. They're marching into this battlefield, and this is what he does. He appoints singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they sang. Give thanks to God for, give thanks to the Lord our God for his faithful love endures forever. At the very moment, say at the very moment, at the very moment they began to sing and give praise The Lord caused the armies of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. The armies of Moab and Ammon turned against their allies from Mount Seir and killed every one of them. After they had destroyed the army of Seir, they then began attacking each other. So when the army of Judah arrived at the lookout point in the wilderness, all they saw were dead bodies lying on the ground as far as they could see. Not a single one of their enemy had escaped. Come on now. Not a single one of their enemy had escaped. Here was a king who just a few verses before that was in fear because there were not one, not two. There were three armies coming for him. This just happened a few verses before. Three armies coming for him. And now all of a sudden the same king is on the battlefield ready to give in all that he has, holding on to the promise of God, and when he walks out on the battlefield, what does he see? His enemies scattered. Isn't it incredible that the very thing that came threatening him destructed itself? The very thing that comes to destroy you can destruct itself if you begin to put faith in the promise of God in your life. Isn't it crazy that they sought the Lord They got a promise from the Lord. They put their faith in the promise. And because they began to put their faith in promise, you know what else happened? Their posture and their approach going into this battle changed. Instead of leading this battle with swords and with chariots, they led this battle with praise. And then what happened? Before they even finished getting to the battlefield, their enemy was done. It was gone. He was done. It was finished. Isn't it incredible that before the battle even began, it was already won? Why? Their posture going into this battle changed. Why? Because they had the promises of God. Why? Because they sought out after the Lord. Why? Because fear kept creeping in. As fear creeped in, they resolved to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said, hey, I got you. Don't worry. Believe that I'm going to do this and watch me fight for you. He did. And then their posture going into the battlefield completely changed. Some of us are in some hard seasons of life, and I don't know what kind of fears you're facing in this room. I know I'm facing some of my own, and I know that there are fears in your life that you're facing of many sorts. And as we go through this journey of life and through our journey of faith, we're going to be dealing with a lot of fearful situations, a lot of fearful situations. But what are we going to decide to do in that moment? What are we doing in this moment right now? 
Are we seeking after the Lord and inquiring of him? Are we pursuing him? What is our first course of action? Do we believe in the promise that he has made that he will fight for us? Do we even know how to identify the battles that rise up that he wants us to show that he can fight for us? How are we approaching fear in our life? And if every one of us in this room desires to become all that God has called them to become, then we're gonna have to learn to overcome fear. And the only way that you could begin to overcome fear is by running after God. Pursue him. I'm not saying don't seek counsel, don't seek comfort in your friends and your family. It's good to, to seek for those things and to ask for comfort and to ask for prayer. It's good for those things to happen, but don't make that your first course of action. Make God your first course of action. Inquire of him. If a great and mighty king who had everything at his disposal still chose to put that aside and run after the Lord, then what does that say about us today? What does that say about us today? Are we running after him and pursuing him? Because he is ready not only to comfort you, but he is ready to deliver you from all of your fears. And know this, fear, the only power that fear has in your life, and I just want to say this to kind of really bring clarity to this, the only power that fear has in your life is to just try to stop you. That's it. It will just try to stop you, to stall you, to hold you back, to keep you from moving forward, to put you in a place where you're doubting and questioning, but that's all that it can do. Lean on to him. Pursue him in time of fear. If I could get the worship team to come to the front, what I want to do um, is I just want to take an opportunity today, and, and I just want to pray for you guys this morning. Um, there are different things that we're obviously facing in life, and and, and fear, we've talked about from the very beginning, is not from God, right? It's not from God. Fear is not from God. And if it's not from God, then I want to take this opportunity right here this morning and just create a space where we um, pray out against this fear that we're dealing in our lives. I don't know what you're battling, what you're facing, what you're trying to overcome, but I just want us as a church this morning to just stand up onto our feet and just like really begin to pray and seek the Lord and just begin to pray against the spirit and power of fear over our lives because God's desire for us is to live in freedom. God's desire for us is to live in victory. God's desire for us is to live in the fullness of the promises that he has made for us. If he has overcome, then we overcome. If he has won, then we win. If he has the victory, then we have the victory. All that he has is yours to experience. So I just want us to really release faith in this room this morning and just begin to pray against things that are fearful in our lives, things that are coming to threaten our peace, things that are coming to threaten our confidence in who God is, things that are coming to threaten our confidence in the promises that he has made for our lives. You are not created to live in fear. You are created to live in peace. You are created to live in victory. You you are created to live in power because that's the price that Jesus paid on the cross for you and I. And it's too high of a price for you and I to settle living being crippled by fear. It's too high of a price for you and I to accept the fearful situations in our life as the final chapter to our story. No, it is not. There is more that God wants to do. There is more that God wants to show you. There are battles that he wants to fight for you. There are victories that he wants you to see and experience in your life, but you have got to seek him for it so let's just lift our hands up in the, in the air right now and just begin to ask the presence of God to come into this place Lord we just surrender our hearts to you in this moment God we just come before you Lord and we just ask for you to begin to remove any sense of fear in our hearts in our lives we pray against the spirit and the power of fear over the people in this room God we ask for your freedom to reign we ask for your hope to reign we ask for your peace to reign Lord God come in this place come in this time right here right now Lord God and just begin to just heal our hearts begin to renew our minds begin to re renew our perspective and our understanding of who he you are Lord God and if there's any hopeless situations right now we speak the hope of God if there's any sicknesses in this room we speak the healing power of God if there's any discouragement in this room we speak the encouraging power of the Holy Spirit to saturate every heart in this room right here right now we say no to fear we say no to fear because fear is a choice and so we choose today as a church God to say no 
no to fear no to fear no to fear no to fear fear will no longer have a grip on anyone's life in this room in Jesus name we come against the power of fear we come against the spirit of fear and we release the comfort the joy the peace and the freedom of the Holy Spirit to reign hallelujah give you praise God we give you praise God just stay in the spirit of worship great battles are won through worship your worship your praise your songs are your weapons in battle just like we learn in King Jehoshaphat's they could have fought with swords but they fought with praise and the minute they began fighting with praise victory was theirs before they even began that battle so come on let's begin to lead it into that place where we begin to to use the battle of our praise as our weapon so whatever is going on in your life right now just begin to sing out to God just begin to praise him thank him God you are good and you are faithful and we thank you for who you are God your love endures forever you are faithful forever Lord God just begin to declare the faithfulness of God through your songs through your praise because this is where power and breakthrough comes this is where victory is is, is, is um, it comes to be real in your life so come on let's press in press in press in press in